Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining a new webinar from Invest. Uh, today, we have quite an interesting topic, how to create a winning content strategy, uh, a winning content strategy that increases uh, conversions. Uh, we have three different points that we are going to be talking about. One is how do you develop a winning content strategy? How do you craft content that really appeals to your different types of uh, visitors, to your customers? And finally, how do you increase conversions through, uh, through content? Uh, with me uh, today, we're very honored to have a legend in the SEO uh, field, uh, Joe Sinkwitz. He's the guy that the top SEO experts go to. They go to when they have, uh, when they have questions. Uh, he is currently with CopyPress. But prior to Copy Press, uh, did about 11 years running a boutique SEO firm. Uh, Joe, uh, thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Very good, excellent. So before we get started, uh, as usual, we like to have these webinars highly interactive. So we have team members on standby. We actually have uh, team members in this sort of funny uh, in three different cities around the globe on standby, uh, watching Twitter, answering uh, your questions uh, in the go to uh, in the go to webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, tweet at us. You can uh, tweet uh, using the hashtag InvestCRO. You can tweet at Invest. Also, you can use the Q and A chat feature, uh, the Q and A feature in the Go to Webinar. Um, with that, let me kick it off to Joe, and I'll start by asking you, Joe, first question: How do you develop a winning content strategy? Okay. Well, whether approaching a situation uh, from scratch or as a byproduct of having done an audit and needing to create a, a content strategy from that via like my agency, Digital Heretics, it's actually a really similar process. First, what I like to do is get a sense of the overall topic of the website, the theme. So from there, I'll use a few tools in helping me to determine what to do. Uh, using SpyFu mm -hmm. and some good old fashioned SERP scraping with Scrapebox, I like to identify the top players uh, currently in the market, where they're ranking, what they're ranking for, where they seem to be getting most of their traffic. So we're trying to view the overall corpus of the phrases and topics that the competitors rank for. Uh, then I'll segment it into topical buckets, and after that I'll correspond uh, my domain's rankings within those specific phrases uh, to the various competition, paying attention to the expected uh, commercial intent. I'm looking at the PPC volume statistics uh, within SpyFu at this point to get a rough gauge of where are those low hanging fruit opportunities. But you know that's not enough. So I'll I'll pair that with linking data from Ahrefs to help me determine which pages that I might need to create from scratch that are not currently being covered. Which pages really need to be rewritten, whether it's dialed down in, in terms of one topic to support another, or which just need to be completely overhauled, which need to be combined because there might be multiple pages covering a topic that just aren't strong enough and need to be combined into kind of a, a super topical pages, uh, which might need to be uh, interlinked better throughout the domain. Sometimes the, the solution is simply navigational flow of ec link equity, and then which pages need some degree of external link love in order to rank better. So, I mean, all, all that said, I, I'm excited about something else, though, because on Tuesday, uh, I was brought up to San Francisco by Search Metrics to take a look at something. And they're betaing a product in, uh, I guess, their, their, their suite version, which is going to be able to handle all of that within one tool. So that's kind of cool. So you might be able to take a look and say, okay, here's the topics, here's the link flow, here's the social stats. Where should I be trying to focus my time and energy that is working really well for the competition? That's what it all really comes down to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, like a, a trained mind still needs to understand what to do with all the data. But I mean, I know, Khalid, like you went through this yourself. So you got to see the, first, the process firsthand. You get to see like, once you have that information on hand, it all starts to make sense about where you should be going 
And that's that's my approach. That's you know I've been doing it for for many many years now, and it's been tweaked a little bit, but it's a fairly straightforward process that you could use to really get a lot of value out of your content strategy. Very good. So you've mentioned a couple of the tools, and you've also mentioned the new tool, which is really exciting. I mean, I think this is one of the. By the way, I think one of the biggest challenges with you know with working like you know you have many different tools, and each one of them is really good at doing one thing. Uh, so you find yourself just switching and like you know between different tools. Uh, tell us uh, until until this new tool comes out, some of your favorite tools while you are developing this content strategy. You mentioned SpyFu uh, as one of those tools. What else? So there's SpyFu. There's Ahrefs. Uh, those two are really good. Um, if you're using, like, if you're working on an existing site and it's a pretty big site, especially one that's really good is OnPage.org um, because you're able to use that to determine which uh, which SEO elements are you potentially missing, what do you have configured incorrectly, where are titles too long, where are you uh, duplicating content on uh, on accident throughout the site. It's almost like a, a quick audit tool. Um, I also really like to use Xenu. Uh, some people are fanatic about Screaming Frog. I've just used Xenu for so long that I know what to expect when I'm running it. Um, that's really great for doing deep spiders on sites. Uh, helps you to identify where you might have made mistakes on redirecting pages. Maybe some pages are accidentally set up with real canonical situations that you didn't intend for. Uh, those are very real pitfalls. So recently, uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the transition from Odesk to Upwork. And the difficulty here is Upwork is was a, a parked domain. It had no equity behind it. It was basically brand new. And Odesk is a huge brand. So we had to try to figure out how are we going to collapse this entire thing into a new domain without losing any visibility. And it worked. We were able to do it with a lot of hard work. But some of it was constantly spidering the site to see, hey, this page did not properly migrate over to the other. Um, it goes a long way. Definitely. And I, I see some of the questions that are coming about some of the names of the tools. Uh, what we'll do is we make the transcript of the webinar available, and we'll get Joe to review some of those tool names in case of spell. And this way, we'll make sure that everybody has access to them. I'll, I'll go back to this point, and this is something at least I'm, I'm guilty of. Uh, and I have to say, uh, Joe helped us actually with with invest because we saw a drop in our ranking, and we're you know we're on uptick right right now. But lots of times, many people think that they've got the technical SEO issues, the you know the duplicate content issues, the titles, the, and I thought we have it because you know I mean, I work quite a bit with quite you know many many SEO experts, and I we have clients, and so I'm like oh there's you know surely our website is perfect, and when he looked at the website. Of course. Oh boy. <laughs> and, uh, even when he actually sent me the initial report, I think it took me like two, three months for it to sink uh -huh. in how bad the situation was. Um, but do you see that, that many companies until now are really falling into that trap of, of problems? Like, and I know we're talking about content over here, but you got to have these, the solid you know, kind of uh, base like, you know, to build that content on top of. Pretty much all of them. And I think the reasoning is we kind of fall into our own trap of, you know, we had success in the past, so therefore we're just going to keep continuing to have success. And sometimes it's entirely unintentional where you might be cranking out blog posts and they're awesome by themselves. But when you start to say, hey, there's a pattern where for whatever reason we're really repeating ourselves a lot and maybe that, that information needs to be condensed. Or it could be a simple a situation as there may have been an update on WordPress that changed how the core functionality of your site works. And that opens up a whole can of worms too. Definitely, definitely. So this is something at least I, I, I think like this is something I've learned from Joe. Run like you know one of these audit tools very regularly because you never know yes. what you might what you might fi find. And you want to find it out before Google starts you know changing the algorithm or <laughs> punish you and then it takes a while to to recover. So we, we run some analysis, then we put, uh, we, we look at kind of the competitive landscape, uh, you know, create like kind of topics of like, you know, or a topical, like, you know, areas within, within the, within the website. Um, there's always this, it seems to me that there's this balance between what works for, for search engines and what works 
for, for humans. Um, and, and typically, I know we've always said, like, you know, write for the human, the search engines will, will follow suit. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm correct or not, but it seems to me like lately, no, you, you really have to pay close attention to both, keep both, uh, both in mind. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes and no. I mean, really, when you, when you boil it down into really simple variables, what is the search engine really looking for? They're measuring links in some capacity, whether it's the velocity of them, where they're from, what, what they're saying when they point to you. They're looking at the content uh, in terms of whether it's good or bad. There's a lot of variables that go into that. And they're looking into that overall user engagement. They're looking, you know, click-through rates, time on site, all that good stuff. When you're crafting content, if you're able to tick those boxes off, you're able to satisfy both because I'd say usually when you're creating something that's really good for a user and they're performing an action on your site, that's how I determine good content, something that results in the action you actually wanted. Um, that's going to have a positive search response because if that action is you know, reading your entire long-form article, your time on site is going to be great. If the action is clicking into your form and filling it out, that's going to be good too. The only time when it's potentially not that great is if you're creating, you know, made for AdSense sites still. And so they, they pop onto the site and the content, that's when you want it to actually be very poor. You want the ads to be the superior piece of content to drive the click. That is not congruent with what search engines generally want. But overall, I think we're getting closer to, you know, what you're creating for the user being more or less what the search engines are going to be looking for. That, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> In terms of... Um, User user engagements, um, and, and we'll get a little bit more into that. But you know, we're talking about like you know, creating and engaging uh, content. Uh, and I see a question over here uh, as well. <laughs> same same thing. I was going to ask you, how do you measure user engagement? Is it pages uh, per session? Is it time on site? Different metrics that you want to look at. What do you think uh, Google looks at? And you know, Google has also Google Analytics for most websites. You know, so they get quite a bit of data about about different websites. But what, what are your thoughts about user engagement and how to measure that? Okay, so they, I, I view a few different things. One uh, aspect of the engagement is almost pre-experience, and that's the click-through rate into your site as compared to the other potential listings on that page that a user could potentially click. So we see that a lot in PPC, right? So your, your ability to get a lower PPC pricing has in part, you know, due to how, how good is your ad copy that they're going to click on? So right away, within you know, organic search, your, your click-through rate is going to be determined on how good is that title and description for someone to want to click on. That's where it begins. Yeah. They measure that. They also measure how quickly is the user leaving. So yeah. it's not just a matter of whether the user is logged into Google to be able to track that data, but now that Chrome is the biggest you know, browser on the planet, they have all that data as well. So it's just a significant amount of data. They're able to use it. Whether they're using it significantly today, there's debate. Uh, I can show some things that I do via my agency on the uh, online reputation management side of things <laughs> that show that they do use the, the click and bounce to some degree. Beyond that, I do really like to see uh, time on site. I like to see, are they, are they viewing the page? Are they navigating as well with it to other pages? Is it, a, is it just a one uh, view session or is it a multi-view session? So just looking at those couple of variables, if you're maximizing for time on site and multiple uh, view sessions, you're probably going to have a pretty good uh, outcome. Very good, very good, excellent. Um, so you guys, uh, let me see. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to, into this. Well, since we have like you know, we're, actually people are still joining by the way, which is really uh, incredible. But uh, tell us a bit about the kind of work that you guys do. And I'm like you know, departing a little bit, but like you know, some of the work that you know, CopyPress does, some of the work, other work that that you do on the side, you know, as. Sure. So I mean, I guess it's kind of like a late intro, but so um, I'm the chief of revenue for Copy Press. Mm -hmm. So I, I handle all those sales and marketing. They, they kind of report up into me. What we focus on is being like a full service content marketing company. So everything from the ideation, research, writing, 
design and development. So anything that's content related that one creates as a function of a campaign, that's copy press. Digital heretics, which is my agency, is a little differently. We focus on problems usually. So whether it's reputation management, whether someone needs to be audited and pr produce a strategy, that's that line of work. And they actually work fairly complementary back and forth because, you know, I don't want to be producing all the content at the agency for sure. So I'll, I'll give it to Congress to say, you guys have 20,000 something people that are good at doing this. You work on it. Very good. No, excellent. And I've seen both work hand in hand and the system works really, really well. So we talked about developing a winning content strategy. Let's move on to the next next point. So I, I have my overall uh, strategy. A uh, couple of questions. First, how long, uh, like in, in terms of uh, time span, does a good content strategy should should cover? Are we talking about three months, six months, twelve months? And then within that content strategy, how do I craft content that works well? We've just talked a little bit about like you know that the the search engine and the users are, are getting closer to to each other. So let's start with the first the length of, of time for for a good content strategy, uh, you know, laid out plan. I, I'm sure that to some degree it depends upon the industry. I like to view a year out if I can, because a year out I think you can get a pretty good cadence for how much of different types of content you might want to deploy. It also gives you a fair amount of time to to fix what needs to be fixed and to to allow that to kind of you know boil within the search engine. So let them see what's going on. But then when it comes to to crafting the content that meets those demand needs, to me it's really an extension of the overall strategy. Uh, two variables that I haven't really addressed yet um, that could change your strategy is to be really obsessive uh, when it comes to paying attention to your analytics. Because what you see that's already converting um, is more important than what I'm going to tell you. Mm. So if, if what's converting, it, allows you to create more of that type of content, whether it's on that topic or if it's that type of content um, type, that makes a big difference in what's going to be happening for you and whether or not you're going to be successful. It's, it's a fairly straightforward process. I mean, you're, you're, you're digging through your data, you're seeing what's working, and you keep creating more. Hmm. The other piece um, that I think is neglected some, some people agree with me and some do not, but I still like to use it, is setting up broad match PPC campaigns. Okay. Because if you're trying to figure out what are all the potentials around a topic, creating those broad matches allow you to granularly see within your own analytics because it gets actually passed on paid traffic. You know, keyword not provided, you know, at least skips that. You're able to very quickly say, okay, I thought this is our market, but our market's actually bigger and it shifted over here instead. Mm. And it allows you to say, okay, this is more data that I originally did not you know, foresee, and you can you know, rework your overall can, uh, strategy and campaigns to, to reflect that. It's the real data. The real data is more important than perceived strategy. So you have to allow yourself to adapt. Even though I said a year, I like to work within that year time frame. as you have data, Allow, allow yourself to ship that strategy. Very good. So you've mentioned something about like you know, uh, and, and when when you first start talking about like you know, it needs to be about a year, uh, allowing you to create content, let that that con let that content boil, whether either with the engines or with the users, and fix. If I if I'm introducing a new piece of content, even if I'm getting a new link, if I'm you know, and, and this is a question that we hear quite a bit. How long do you think it takes until you see the impact or the effect of that that new piece? Uh, on your ranking, on your overall website, you know, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So it, it really depends. It could be very quick, or it could take weeks and weeks and weeks. So one thing that was changed in early June is Google made a change on how quickly they're indexing certain types of pages and links. Hmm. I found that particularly interesting to me on the black hat side of things because it really slowed down how fast stuff gets, uh, gets indexed. On, on the whiter hat side of things, it 
it shows that to some degrees, the higher the authority of something linking into you, the quicker you're going to see something from it, especially if it has a secondary effect. And what I mean by that is if you were to be linked to from the home page of Forbes because of something you did like a, a PR story, the likelihood of a lot of people also writing about that is going to be significantly high. And that shows some, you know, some buzz coming into your site. And Google does like to try to reflect that. That's similar for, for Bing as well. Uh, when it comes to new content, it appears how, I mean, it, it depends on how it's set up. If, if the new content is just a page you throw on your domain, but it's not really linked to from anywhere, it's not promoted anywhere, the chance of it having an impact is going to be very low because it, it can exist in a vacuum. That, that's the one takeaway I want to show is everything has to have a campaign focus when you, when you work online now. You know, you have your content, you have your outreach, you have, you know, social strategies, you have your display strategies. Make that all work together, and I hate the word synergy, but there is a synergy to it, and it'll have a much quicker and more impactful impact. So now you also talked about a couple of other things in terms of getting obsessive with looking at your uh, analytics. So great, I will be obsessive about looking at my analytics, but let's talk about a process uh, over here. Um, you know, we have our webinar attendees. By the way, your, your black hat is also getting quite a bit of comments <laughs> over here. <laughs> there you go. I just threw that on because I thought it'd be fun. But... Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if anybody's going to, you know, point it out. So, of course, there's yeah. somebody who would notice something like that. Um, getting obsessive about analytics translate that into something actionable for uh, our webinar uh, attendees? Okay, so one thing that I'd be obsessive when I'm, when I'm going through and I'm in Google Analytics and picking through is there may be certain phrases that according to my original data show would be more than likely low conversion phrases. Maybe I thought Maybe I created a page for it because I thought, well, it'll be easy to rank for and I might get a conversion a day. But if that's converting, you know, 10 times what I thought it would, that suggests that I need to spend more time developing up this topic. Uh, maybe I need to add more calls to actions on the site to see, can I get it from 10x to 100x? Uh, that's just one simple thing. Another thing is if I create a piece of content and I find that users are specifically navigating towards it, but I haven't been promoting it appropriately off page, then I need to increase the amount of promotion externally so that I have that specific page as an entry point as well. So I'm providing uh, the user immediate access to what they initially were looking for. So those are some of the things that I'd look at. Uh, additionally, if I have a page that has a very high click-through rate, why? I, I need to fix that. Is it because it's a very thin page and people didn't care? Well, in that case, maybe I need to rewrite it. Maybe I need to 301 it to another page. Maybe I need to 410 it. So those are the types of questions you always have to be thinking about. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, uh, just working with you over the last few months and some of these questions that you've asked me and you've pointed out to some, some pages, I, I, I come to Joe and I say, you know what, this page used to rank, it used to rank like, you know, top of like, you know, the SERPs. And he looks at it and he's like, well, it's very obvious. I'm like, no, it's not obvious to me. It's like, well, it's a very, you know, piece of content. Or sometimes, uh, and we, we really, when we created the content, we were not thinking about search engines. But you know, you're writing about a topic, and you end up repeating the word again and again. Yes. Google looks at it and says, ah, oh, you're trying to trick me or something. So we're having to go back and rewrite some of the content. And, and it's, been it's a very natural habit to fall into, too. Yeah, definitely. So. Let's go into setting up a, a, the broad match PPC campaign, trying like, okay. let, let's dig deeper into that. Um, why, and, and why would that work better versus just looking at like, you know, some of the other, other reporting? Uh, how would that really allow me to figure out what content would work, would work better? Sure. So setting it up is actually really easy. It's as simple as, you know, having a campaign, having an ad group, and then throwing in you know, a single phrase that's broad matched. So let's say it's conversion optimization broad matched. What we'll end up seeing with the data is you're going to get a lot of clicks, and initially you're going to be a little bit angry because you're spending a lot of money on these clicks. 
But what you're also going to see then is there will be phrases that you never considered to be potentially relevant to your site. The way that they're, they've kind of modified broad match over the years is it may not even say conversion optimization. It might say something completely different. It might say uh, website optimization. It might say improved website. For whatever reason, yeah. they need the topical uh, connection between one phrase and another. That data is very useful, especially if they clicked through and they performed your action. That's a win-win uh -huh. because now you could say, hey, you know, I at least you know broke even on this particular phrase. Now I could really expand this. I have a whole new topical area that I could focus on to satisfy my users. Very good. So how would that work if you have a large enterprise uh, website? Um, you know, it can get a bit a bit expensive. Is there kind of a right balance there? Um, you know, it's everything is a test, right? I mean, I don't have to tell you know an AB guy that everything's a test, but it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Luke, the global head of uh, TripAdvisor, mm -hmm. uh, he employs the strategy too because it works. Now, obviously, their budget's going to be a heck of a lot higher than what I could personally spend on doing this, but this is how they approach it. They might put in something like Atlanta Hotel and see what comes up. What kind of secondary, tertiary type phrases, what other types of interrelated topics can be approached? How should uh, a smaller entity do it? Uh, basically the same way, just on a slower pace. Okay. Because you're not going to want to burn your budget. I mean, uh, you and I probably do not have the capacity to launch several thousand concurrent campaigns and make sense of all the data right away. You know, so we're having to approach it piece by piece. And that's how I do it. I take what works as a strategy and then just work on little slivers at a time. Okay. And I, I think that's, that's just an amazing tip because, you know, setting up such campaigns will be able to give you insights on what's working for some of your visitors. I think that, you know, we, we probably did not think about and then that, that gives you insights and then you can create that content and you no longer have to rely on PPC but give you that insight, insight that you need. Um, what else uh, are some of the things that you want to think about when you are crafting that, that content that, that captures, uh, captures uh, visitors? Well, I mean, a lot of times it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, based on experience, you might come up and understand that a specific type of content is going to work better um, based on the overall historical data of your domain or other projects that you worked on in the past. And sometimes, you simply just need to run a test to say, I don't know what's going to happen if I put on a video, but I'm going to put on a video and see what happens. Mm. Um, I mean, we can we could talk that a little bit on various case studies, but that's that's how a lot of entities approach it, where they're always tweaking some aspect of their site, whether it's you know uh, button colors or call to actions, or if it's saying, okay, what if we go from 200 words to 2,000 words in this page? Let's just play it, see what happens. That's very interesting. You know, one one thing I was uh, I was looking at uh, HubSpot and it's uh, it's very impressive how much they've grown, regardless of their business model and, and what we think uh, of it. You know, it seems to be working semi okay. <laughs> uh, but what's interesting is they take the top their top landing pages that people are are landing on on the website, and then they create a uh, an almost like a subscription call to action that is specific for the page based on how people are getting engaged. Um, so we're thinking about doing the same thing at investment. I'm like, wow, this is going to be quite a cumbersome, you know, task. If you want to take the top landing pages, let's say top 30. And for each one of them, of course, you have to have a specific content piece. Um, you know, let's say, right. let's say, you know, the top landing page, and I'll just give an example. Let's say it's about HR policies or something like that. And somehow, you know, hundreds of people are coming. Well, now you want to create a white paper that like you know talks about yes. this and then you, you will get subscriptions but now you're talking about a really cumbersome you know process because now I need to have this white paper or something a giveaway so I can capture the email of, of my visitors but that, that's really what SEO uh, SEO is about now it's not only just about bringing people but how do you capture them how do you engage them how do you keep them connected with your website it's really become like overall digital marketing mm -hmm. so you're able to work that into your overall content strategy so you know, based on what HubSpot's doing, that, hey, I need to be able to provide niche-specific landing pages and very relevant products specifically to put them into a specific sales channel. 
it works, and I, I think it'll tie back into the search uh, signals as well because those people are going to now be branded with invest. Mm -hmm. And so the likelihood of them searching invest HR policy white paper when they tell their friends about it in the industry, it's going to be higher. I, I don't think there's much downside to that other than you know time and energy and how that relates to another activity you might be able to do. Definitely, and it's just that ultimately it's a, about balancing the, the, those two, like you said, you know, the, the time and effort here versus uh, versus another another activity. Um, right. One thing, like you know, um, and I don't know what, what are your thoughts on this. Um, in terms of ranking on Google and the fact that people might type your address or or a content directly and they come to it not through the search engine, would that help improve your ranking or or not? You know, the direct direct access uh, to a piece of content. Is oh, the, the direct navigation. Uh, yeah. Does that send a signal to Google that, you know what, you know? So, I mean, if, if, if they're hitting that specific URL, like the HTTPS, the whole URL string, mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's still kind of minor. But if, they're, if you have a significant amount of traffic and they have either the, the Google toolbar installed or they're using Chrome, it would be negligent not to use that, that data at some point. I think currently, if it's a signal, it's going to be a fairly weak signal. But long term, um, I mean, it might you might consider it a dystopian future or a positive future. But they're going to have so much with relation to user signals that they could probably get rid of links in you know 15 years from now and not have to worry about it because it's just so much data they control. Definitely. So uh, let's not let's not jump into 15 years uh, from now. What do you think are the top, let's say, five signals when it comes to good quality content? When it comes to Google, judging that okay, well, you know, this is a good piece of content, um, you know, and we should have it rank rank better. Is it getting links? Mm -hmm. Where are those links coming to? Coming from rather? Like the more authoritative, the better. If uh, you know, how long are they going to be staying on that particular page? With, were they, was it extremely relevant content? Mm -hmm. If you look at um, trying to think, I want to say on do.com. So Mary Newlands and John uh, uh, Rampton just recently launched this site um, a couple months back. On a blog post, they they did, I think, I'm trying to think about how long it was. I want to say it was something like, 20,000 words, a very, very, very long piece of content. But then they got links from the Huffington Post, Forbes. I mean, they're natural links because it was a very good piece of content. It now ranks for, I think, uh, free website hosting, something along those lines. Wow. I'd have to go back and look at the specific example. That's a very tough phrase. Definitely. But because the, the, the content was so in-depth and the links coming in were so good, that's a really good one-two punch. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, um, I think a lot of search going forward is going to be, how do I not trip a filter? You know, it's going to be, how do I not be too aggressive with the phrases I'm using on page? How do I not be too aggressive with the anchor phrases pointing into me? How do I ensure that the mix of good links to potentially bad links is in my favor? Now, that that's a a poor thing that we have to do, but I see that being a stronger focus. So, um, so those other three variables would be on the uh, the repetitiveness on the phrase, uh, you know, panda. You know, how weak is the content? It would be on the the weakness of the link, the profile, and the anchor phrasing. Very good, very good. So, it's sort of funny because you know, kind of in the last six seven months, to a good extent, we said the death of links and. and I have to say, like, you know, for a while, and I'll, I'll talk about invest, we shied away from link building. I mean, you know, we yeah. used to do guest posting, we used to do quite a bit, and then we decided, you know what, enough with all of this, because we just could not figure out what Google wants. Um, but now we're, we're, we're back in a, in a much more judicious uh, way, in a judicious manner, and I think we see the impact of that. So you're done, and, and, you know, when I asked you the it's top five, approach. definitely, and, and you said so you, you put... Too. like you know you talked about like you know are, are you are they getting links where they're getting the links from so you still think links play a role uh, you know? oh yes that they still play a very significant role and like on my black hat projects 
I'll say it's 90% links. Like, you're not going to rank on payday loans if you're just creating a big piece of content and think it's great. You're yeah. going to have to push through a dump truck full of links. It's yeah. just the reality. It's the way it works. Um, eventually that may change, but it has not yet changed. Mm, interesting, interesting. You know, it's sort of, uh, uh, sort of like, an, and again, we'll have a link to that, uh, to, to the site or the 20,000 words uh, that you might okay, have. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I was reading a, a post by Neil Patel, and I'm just Im impressed with the guy because for the amount of content that he produces. And then next time I see him, I'm going to ask him straight up. I'm like, are you producing it yourself or somebody writing it for you? Um, you know, because he's writing close. I will not answer that for yeah. you. Uh, I have to say, though, good chunk of it. Uh, this is my own judgment. I haven't done quite a bit of analysis. 70 or 80 percent is consistent tone and voice. Uh, but it's close to like, you know, ah, and I see, you know, yeah, 17,000 words a week. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's that's quite a bit. But what do you think, like, you know, for for let, let, let's think about like kind of this, the small to, to mid-sized business, uh, if they're maintaining a blog. And we talked about a full year plan. And ultimately, the goal is to increase conversions. Um, how frequently should they should they post? How long do these posts should be? Uh, thinking about that right balance between SEO and, and conversion. Yeah, it, and it's a really tough answer because it's easy to provide quick advice and say, oh, at least 500 words once a week, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a more responsible answer would say, let's create a strategy where small to medium sized business, you are blogging, let's say it's once a week, and I'll stick with that, yeah. blogging once a week, but it's covering a specific topic competently. So rather than focusing on the size of the content, you're going to focus on the, the depth of the content and the, the satisfaction of that particular user's query. Mm -hmm. Satisfaction could be reached in 100 words or it could be reached in 1,000 words. Yeah. Beyond that, I, would, I like to mix in other content types. So I mean, I'm obviously fond of you know, selling or trying to sell you like infographics and interactive stuff. But I like using multiple content types because you could tie it back to blog posts. You could have a blog post reference it. You could always uh, do, like Aaron Wall is fantastic about this. Yeah. When he's writing, he's always, in, always referencing previous assets that are very relevant to discussion. And it just keeps that, that overall flow working both for search engines and because it's useful to the user, it's helpful there. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to data, if it shows that uh, a faster or a, a more frequent uh, cadence for posting is appropriate, speed it up. Mm -hmm. If it shows that there's not a lot of impact, it's just a very slight impact, dial it back. Maybe it's one post every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just once a month, but it's a very, very long post. So I think it's, it's a, a combination of Try to set a strategy based on the data you have and then reformulating that strategy as data comes in. Very good. And uh, before, before we move, move on to the last point in uh, today's, uh, today's webinar, um, I want to remind our webinar attendees, uh, if you have any questions, and I see some questions coming through, please use the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, go to webinar. Uh, I promise to ask most of these questions to Joe, um, but I don't want to keep everybody more than an hour. The people get bored and they have other things to, to do. Uh, so I see some questions over here, but we'll leave them until uh, until the end. Um, increasing conver increasing conversions through content. Top advice, case studies. Uh, the floor is yours. Sure, sure. So I pulled out a couple case studies. Um, some are going to be our clients, some are not. Some of our clients they don't like this to talk about at all. So I have to temper that. Um, the first one I'll I'll talk about is a very simple one. So Auto Revo. Uh, Greg Gifford used to be there. He's since moved on to uh, another firm. But Auto Revel, it works in the automotive dealership space. And on auto dealerships, a lot of times they'll use the same database for populating their, their car listings. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. You go to multiple dealers, you see the same thing. Well, all they had to do was say, hey, we're going to have more detailed information about a listing. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that. By creating that more detailed piece of information, the user is going to be, you know, it's going to have a higher satisfaction rate. 
they if they're viewing three different listings and they see the same listing, they hit your listing of the same car even, and it's more detailed and it, and it actually answers what they were looking for. They didn't want to know miles per hour, you know, uh, miles per gallon. Maybe they wanted to understand something else about the car. Maybe there's a, a, a user experience about the interior of the car that made more sense. They're they're going to convert better. Additionally, I think they're also very superior in how they utilize on-page elements like the real-time chatting and mm. calls to action, uh, aggressive timeline with retargeting, but that backs off after a few weeks just in case you already bought a car. Stuff like that, it, the conversions and content go very much hand-in-hand. Hand. The, the online chatting is used by a lot of dealers, but it doesn't matter if they try to use that if the listings are really weak because... Yeah. Most people don't want to spend their time trying to chat with someone unless they know that this car is the car that they're looking for. Um, another example that I like is Flipkey. Flipkey is uh, TripAdvisor vacation rentals. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like this example is within the travel space, you usually come across standard listing pages. So it might say, here's a via, a villa in Turkey that you can go ahead and, you know, uh, rent for a couple weeks that I can't afford. Say, oh, that's beautiful. So they contacted Copy Press, and we designed out a series of parallax pages, so interactive content that allows a user to take a virtual tour of a city. So on the Phoenix landing page, you can go to all the, the you can go to the sporting venues, and you're you're driving around in a car to different areas in in Phoenix. And the reason that this is really impactful from a content perspective on uh, conversions is that user is captivated. They're very interested in the city already. Now they're able to say, oh, you know what? I do want a place, I, I, want, I want to rent a house that's near the zoo because uh, I really want to go to the zoo while I'm here with my kids. And it, it just helps with the overall flow. It helps them to understand this is where I'm going to be. And of course, for SEO reasons, we like to deep link from the interactive into other sections of the site, like the landing pages of those particular listings. So it's a, it's a win-win for multiple angles. Definitely. Um, a third example is Zappos. Now, everyone knows Zappos. They, they sell a ridiculous amount of shoes. Um, there was a recent study that came out, but I'm going to reference an older one. So in 2013, they had uh, some data that came out on Zappos that showed that simply by putting on a very simple uh, video embed on product descriptions, they saw a, between a 6% and a 30% jump in conversions depending on the product. These are not like extensive videos. It might be a pair of shoes and it's showing a rotating pair of shoes or a woman picking it up and flipping it over. So here's the bottom of the shoe, here's the top of the shoe. Conversions jumped. Like to me, when I saw that, I said, if I have an e-commerce site, I'm going to have videos on it just because it plays very well. I mean, it doesn't matter what the e-commerce product is. We've all seen unboxing videos and you know on YouTube how powerful they are. I mean, this is this is an iPhone 5. It's an older phone, no big deal. Mm -hmm. But I watched unboxing videos to see, okay, how does it really feel in that person's hand? How big is it? Is it too heavy? It it plays. Definitely, definitely. Let me, I'll, I'll give a couple of uh, sort of like, you know, different examples. Um, one of our, you know, long time, uh, long time clients, skis.com and product videos, uh, you know, they, they get, uh, they get these new products from the manufacturer. So they have their staff members go out, uh, they're, they're based in Michigan. So they go out and there's quite a bit of snow as you can, you can imagine, but adding those product videos, significantly increased conversions uh, and initially they had those videos in a section of the website that was away from the actual product listing page but when we brought those uh, product videos to the actual e-commerce product page I mean it was there people were watching the video intrigued and, and just clicking on that add to cart um, but let, let's jump in like you know kind of a negative side of, of video and I don't see it anymore but you know the, those um, virtual models when you walk into a website, hello, you know, thank you, buy this. What are your thoughts on this? I, I can mention some horrible case study, you know. Yeah, but so, I mean, we tested this. Mm. We, we, we tested it on some of our, like, payday loan uh, brand, yeah. uh, you know, big sites. 
And to some degree, it, when it was novel, it worked, right? So, like, in the very beginning, people were not used to it. Like, whoa, what's, what's going on? Now I kind of view those as, like, an autoplay video. Yeah. I hate autoplay video. If I go to ESPN and they pop up an ad video and they autoplay another video at the same time, like, this is just distracting. Yeah. So I think it may have just reached that distraction. If it was a, a real person that was popping up on your site, like uh, maybe a person sitting at a, a customer service, like, wait, it seems like I'm here to answer your question. Where are you from? Like, I think that would have an impact. Yeah. Or a positive one, at least. Yeah, I mean, I, I recall one of uh, one of our uh, clients who sold furniture online. And this was when that virtual model thing was just coming coming on. And, and somebody convinced him. And he spent, uh, if you recall, when it first came out, it was kind of an outrageous amount of money. And they went to a studio and recorded it. And he launched it on his website. And we came and said, you really shouldn't do that without A-B testing it. And he's like, well, we already paid you know, for it. And I'm like, well, let's just test it. Because you never know if it's if it's good or not. Uh, we tested, and I think that virtual model for that particular website, uh, I think, resulted in a, almost six or seven percent loss of sale. Well, um, you know, and he's like, "Well, we've already spent, I think, thirty or forty thousand dollars on it." I'm like, "Well, I mean, I guess you can put it, but lose even more money." So, you know, exactly. <laughs> Sub cost. Exactly. So it, it is. It is. It is what it is. Uh, what are some of the uh, other other kind of uh, actionable uh, insights that you can give our webinar uh, attendees on like, you know, increasing conversions through through content? Some ideas that, that they think about, some things that they can implement right away in the next, I'll say, you know, five to six days. So I, I think another thing that I'd consider is the curation, or uh, not curating content on your site, but when you're creating content, having an idea in mind of where would you want to see it curated? And I, I like to talk about humor. So if you're creating something humorous, I like to think of, could I envision this piece of content being on FARC.com? Could I envision this really deep scientific understanding being on Reddit? So viewing the, the curation uh, ahead of time allows you to plan for how the content's going to flow. I think that can pull in conversions because it's now putting you in front of a particular uh, target psychodemographic audience that may you know, come in and perform the desired action. Um, that sounds like fairly simple advice, but it's actually really hard mm -hmm. because you may find that if, if you're creating a very visual content, you might need to ensure that you're curated properly on Pinterest. Yep. That can be really difficult. So I mean, there's a, there's a whole strategy for properly you know, marketing on Pinterest. Maybe you have very short videos. Maybe you want to be curated on Vine. That's a, that's a different audience. That's a different strategy. So just by thinking at first of where your, your audience lives elsewhere off your site allows you to kind of craft what you're going to create, and that drives the strategy. Okay. And, and it's sort of funny you mentioned this because sometimes I would start writing uh, an article, and I, I try at least to commit to writing something every couple of weeks. And then sometimes I finish it and I'm like, okay, this is not going on invest.com. I, I need to find a really like high like authority domain uh, because that will give us a lot of like, you know, branding awareness, good link, people will be clicking through. And sometimes I'm like, you know, so as, as, you're, as you're writing that piece of content and developing it, you know, you start slowly thinking about the audience the, the, and the perfect place for, for this piece. And it seems to have worked uh, this year. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good strategy to drive more visitors to the website, increase brand awareness, good, really good uh, quality quality links. Um, now, if, if we talk about copy press and, and you guys produce content, um, you know, so the, there is the standard content that, you know, everybody's aware of, but there is the infographics and then you also do the dynamic uh, content. Yes, the interactives. And yeah. um, in all honesty, uh, Sort of sad, but I haven't thought about uh, interactives until we start uh, we start talking about them. Uh, but they seem to work really, uh, really well. Uh, I don't know if we can if we can show an example. I probably should have asked you to prepare, but we'll also have a link to uh, one of these interactives. Unless you can pull something quickly uh, as, as we're as we're speaking. Four Sorry for putting all the spots. My, my aunt, who usually does these webinars, she always tells me like you always put people on the spot asking them. I'm like, well, you know, an idea just. Where do you want me to paste it? Uh, well, no, hold on. I can share. Can I share your screen? Can I let you share your screen? 
Uh, I got a lot of things up on my screen. Right. Send, send me the URL. Um, Let me see if you see okay. that one. And very good. And here we go. Send you another one. Yep. But let's let's start as I'm as I'm uh, as I'm like you know pulling this up. Let's see. Here we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So and of course I'd be remiss if I didn't show one in particular. <laughs> so so bold. this one is my favorite. Okay. The last one. So we'll yeah. So uh, so we did a couple pieces for Airbnb. So we worked with uh, Dennis G when he was at Airbnb on an overall economic impact. Okay. Now, what was really cool about this from a case study perspective is Dennis is really smart, and Airbnb knew that they were facing regulatory pressure in New York at the time. Mm. So they wanted to show that, hey, we're not causing New York revenue. We're bringing New York revenue. Okay. So this worked within their overall PR strategy. Okay. So they had press that was going up for the, their original economic impact which drove links, of course. While we had this interactive go, we were doing outreach. We did some native traffic to it as well in order to get secondary links. Okay. So there's there's all of that aspect and the, 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 the timing of it. Beyond that, though, these interactives deep link with a lot of data into, into the, the desired landing pages. So for SEO benefit, all those links coming in from the Huffington Post and Time Magazine into the piece flow into the, the landing page, so the New York City, you know, rentals or whatever it might be, uh, a, a hotel for the night sort of thing. Okay. That was impactful. Um, I think the second example I gave you was flip key, just in case people wanted to understand what I was talking about earlier. The third, though, I know, is I actually my favorite, yeah, and that is on uh, it's our it's our uh, infographic design process. So flip key. Oh no, did they do it? Is it not scrolling for you? Ah. Ah, horrible. It happens. <laughs> oh, no. Let's skip to the next one. Yeah. Something broke on the key site. Right. I'll let them know. And we'll pull up. This is from Copy Press. It's on Copy Press. So we thought it'd be fun. I like to do everything I can in multiple dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so um, Eric Kaufman and Josh Kunzler came up with an idea of like, hey, let's show people how creating a, a static infographic works, but let's do it <laughs> as an interactive piece to uh -huh. show them the entire process of here's people going back and forth, and it highlights all the various capabilities. What's cool about this is if someone goes through this entire process, there's call to actions to start the process yourself. So we do get leads coming in specifically from this. And then you know from the success of this, we decided to do another one for copy creation, which is working out nicely as well. Very good. And I think people can see how, like, you know, uh, so uh, it's HTML5, or what, what do you guys use to? Yes, yes. We love working in HTML5 versus Flash for a couple reasons. One, uh, it has a future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two, it works on mobile devices. So you're able to take something like this, and you have to play with it. I mean, there's, there's some technical labor involved. <clears throat> you're able to make a HTML5 piece work extremely well on a phone um, if, if you think about it in advance. Doing that on Flash is not going to work. Definitely. Additionally, uh, you're able to flow through the links better with HTML5 because it's HTML. It's yeah. just, you know, the, the markup's uh, all the same. Definitely. No, that, that makes sense. And I see how even within this, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, you're, you're explaining the whole process. It's showing the capabilities. Uh, it's a really good, uh, good piece. So I, I really like When did you guys put this up? Because I haven't seen it before. Uh, that went up uh, a couple months ago. Okay. I think I had I had already put you through the the, the sales process, <laughs> so I didn't have to show it. <laughs> That's my uh my closing piece. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So let's talk. If if we if we uh let's let's go back into uh creating uh, creating content and you know we've. You've given the webinar attendees some really good uh, good tips, and we'll have these links available. And I see some questions over here, so we will answer some of those questions. Uh, but before we jump into uh, the questions, how does this whole process work for a B two B company, or how would it look different between a B two B company versus a B two C uh, company? It's actually very similar. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of distinction that needs to be made because 
when you're developing out a content strategy, what you're really doing is you're trying to you're trying to get into the mind of the particular consumer. Now, whether the consumer is an end consumer or the consumer is who's going to make the buying decision at a company, very very similar. It's just a matter of who is it going to be. Uh, from there, that that helps to though drive potentially how technical it should be. It might it might change overall tone that you're looking to uh, to address with. I mean, so like. Your content, it's not going to be as snarky. It's not going to be, you know, as informal as a B2C might be able to get away with because you're you're approaching very specific segment that is focused on improving their business versus buying, you know, colored sugar water. Definitely, definitely. Um, so before we jump into into the questions, uh, we've we've covered quite a bit. We talked about how to develop how to develop a winning content strategy, how to craft the content that appeals to the customers, and finally we, we gave some actual case studies about increasing conversions on some companies that were successful in increasing conversions using using content. Um, if you wanna, you know, and then. This, the webinar recording is going to be uh, is going to be available uh, by this coming Monday online. So we'll send it to the webinar attendees. It's going to be available on the YouTube channel. But Joe, if you want to have the top, let's say three or five takeaways that everybody should be, you know, walking away from this webinar, saying, you know what, uh, this is very important. This is what I need to uh, to focus on, whether in strategy or in tactics. Uh, okay. What are your thoughts on that? I'd say first thing first, understand that if you're considering creating content, that that is not the end of the story. You have to understand why you're creating it, who you're creating it for, and what your promotional tactics are going to be, whether it's going to be within search, PPC, whether you're going to be trying to get it curated out. From there, after you understand who you're creating things for and where they live, that's going to drive into your content strategy to determine uh, what tools you might need to use in order to build it. I still do like SpyFu and Ahrefs, so I can recommend those. At the same time, if you're, especially if you're a current search metrics client, look out for when they release their new version uh, based on the beta that I just saw. That's going to be very significant. From there, whatever strategy you come up with, pay very close attention to your analytics because the data that you're being given is more important than any high-priced SEO consultant is going to give you. Uh, that, that carries more weight. Trust yourself there. So if your data is telling you that um, going after a specific phrase is not worth it, move on. Abandon that particular phrase, move on to something more fruitful. Um, it, it, I don't think there's a lot of rocket science to this. I think it's just really a lot of hard work and sitting down and just executing. Executing is the majority of success in this industry. Definitely, definitely. So with that, we have a few questions, and uh, let's let's jump uh, through uh, some of these over here. Uh, so Joe, you mentioned uh, you, you talked about scrape uh, box uh, at the start of the webinar uh, when it comes to planning a, a content strategy. Can you elaborate uh, on that? Sure. So I view scrape box as the Swiss Army knife of the internet. Mm -hmm. It's a very very versatile product that allows you to just very quickly. Um, dissect data. So I'll say that for this specific thing, we will all use Scrapebox with a bunch of proxies loaded in to quickly grab the rankings of, say, a thousand you know different phrases, grabbing as many listings as I can get out of Google. That that's a very simple simple thing. But you could there's so many layers and module on Scrapebox, so you could use it to uh, determine which of these uh, have are set to no cache which of them had their PR stripped at one point in time. If you still care about PR, you can, you can look at it to use as a measurement of some sort. Um, that's primarily how we like to use Scrapebox. Uh, we don't use it to actually drop comments. There's, there's more sophisticated things you could do than that. But it's very handy for uh, analysis. Okay, uh, and and you mentioned something you know you, when you talked about PR. If if you use PR to like you know as uh, what do you use? <laughs> Since you so yeah, that's a good point. So there's no one standard that I really love. I mean, some people really get into DAPA, and that's fine so long as they're consistent and use that one variable. Uh, I personally like Ahrefs uh, Domain Rank and PageRank their versions of it. Um, for what I do because it's still extremely link focused. 
at the same time we wrote our own uh, we wrote our own quality score. So uh, a, several years back, I devised a methodology for determining ranking that did not look at links whatsoever. And the reason I did that was because when Yahoo was dropping their ability to look at uh, the links coming into a site, I want to say how could I potentially perceive the value of a site based on where it's ranking, its ability, its authority of ranking on snippets from within the page, little, little things like that. So we have our own score, and we, we called it EM rank at the time because it's empirical marketing. Mm -hmm. And then we have, we'll use Ahrefs data, that's very good. Uh, page rank, the only time I'll look at page rank within uh, uh, um, Scrapebox is, did it used to have a page rank and then now no longer does? Because that's still uh, an indicator that it was stripped, that it was for some reason penalized, but there's there's some uh, negative correlation to it. But that's about it. I, I don't look at it beyond that. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, another question uh, coming to us over here about uh, the recent recently there was an uh, an uh, Google Web qu Web Quality Algorithm uh, update. Uh, if a site has been hit by that uh, update, uh, by that algorithm, what steps needs to be need to be uh, needs to be done uh, to overcome uh, that that penalty? So that, that's uh, I'm, I'm guessing he's but, talking about Phantom too. Yeah, probably um, the only one that I know of. Most most. I, I, so I saw a lot of correlation between Phantom and sites that are originally hit with Panda. I think it overlaps significantly. Um, some of the sites that I'm watching very closely that were hit by that are usually very large sites. Mm -hmm. And within those, I'll see that there's some pages that are very good, but there's also enough pages that are not very high quality content. And I think that Google's tried to make a determination to say, hey, as a whole, this domain is not great. So instead of like a page by page basis, they try to do some sort of aggregative scoring. That's that's my opinion on it. How to make it better? The same way that you'd fix Panda problems. If it's a crap page, you four-ten it. If there's a lot of pages that all try to answer the same question, try to condense them into one page that's very good. Um, those two things will solve a lot of the problems. And then, of course, going through your content. Are you duplicating your phrases a lot more than you should? Almost everyone does. Fix that. Even though, like, the keyword density is, you know, a la 2000, it's still a thing, and, you know, just address it, and you'll be thankful that you did. Very good. Uh, what, what's a good uh, tool to measure uh, keyword density? I mean, it's sort of like, you know. So, uh, actually, oh, SEO awesome. book is a free one. Uh, the first time you mentioned it to me, I'm like, really? Keyword density? 2,000? I know. But, hey. Um, you know, so there, there are a lot of tools out there, like I'll, I'll pimp Aaron Wall, so uh, Aaron on uh, SEObook.com, uh, under his tool section, he has a free one for, for keyword density. The reason I'll mention just like use one tool, because some tools will strip out navigational uh, structures, some will only look at stuff within the P tag, some, they're all different. Yeah. So stick with one and then get a gauge of like, let's say you have 100 pages and you're looking through and say, wow, there's five pages that, for whatever reason, I'm mentioning it at 30%, and the rest are at 5%. That's a good indicator that you just need to pull back those pages and then re-evaluate. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, another question that, uh, that came to us, what do you think, and I, I'm not uh, sure about this, so you're the SEO guy, uh, Google Search Console in order to optimize your website and make it better for SEO. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I'll throw it to you. Well, I mean... You know, there, there was a day when I really avoided putting stuff in the Webmaster Tools. Um, when it's for a client site or it's for a, a branded site, you, you kind of have to do it now. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll usually talk on very, very negative topics. And some of the things that you could do, you could do by uh, masking bad links that are coming into a site via Ahrefs and Majestic. You could hide from those it's very, if you're trying to poison a site though, you can't have it hide from Google. Mm -hmm. So going on the search console does allow you to see at least a subsection of links that you're getting that might be potentially problematic. Um, I hate having to do disavows, mm -hmm. but I'm negligent if I don't say, you know what, if you get some bad links coming in, disavow them immediately, mm -hmm. try to get them uh, removed as well. That's, that's where that tool comes in handy. 
if you don't have um, a process set up to measure your uptime, it's also kind of handy to go and say, hey, Google tried to crawl your site and it ran into 500 errors, so you could fix some server issues. Uh, making sure your site's mobile compliant, you could do that more or less within that tool as well to say, hey, uh, some of my pages run really slowly and they just, they're not optimized. So you could fix uh, using the data there. Google doesn't give you a lot of great data for SEOs because, frankly, I don't think they like us a whole lot and they prefer we didn't exist. So I'm a little cynical, mm -hmm. but you can use search, uh, you know, the Search Console for for some of your planning. Although I, I have to say, with all the Google algorithm changes, all they're doing is they're also to some extent keeping SEO guys in, in business, correct? <laughs> and design. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like like Panda and Penguin, yeah, it was great for audit guys initially. Yeah. But look at the inconsistency when it comes to when the updates run and how long it takes and all the misinformation, like uh, Gary Isles saying, oh, yeah, it's running real time, and then to find out it was not running real time. Yeah. From a client perspective, if they say, well, hey, Google says it's running real time, and the SEO is like, I swear it's not, it causes conflict. So I think they really like that conflict to exist. So yes, it's good for people that really know what they're doing, um, but it also hurts us at the same time because clients are not sure. Yeah. And that freezes investment, and it also uh, freezes us in terms of you know, our credibility. Definitely. And I think that what I've learned after, after being in the, in the industry for so long that there are some authorities that – yeah, eventually find out that they know about Google perhaps a lot more than some of the Google engineers. Um, I come from a software background and I would tell you like, you know, we were on some very large projects with like, you know, 300, 400, 500 engineers. And even as a software architect, I could never claim that I know every piece of content, like, you know, every piece of code, because ultimately some developer somewhere wrote something. How, I, I don't know how, it, you know, the software would react in a specific way. So sometimes, Actually, people who are observing the software and how it reacts in real life situations are a lot more aware than the actual software developer who thought his software would be in a particular uh, I agree with you. Uh, way. Um, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, lots of people are, are uh, thank you for, for thanking you for uh, taking the time to attend the webinar. I'm, I appreciate the comments that are coming through the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, last, last question we'll take. And we've kept people more than an hour, so we appreciate the, uh, people sticking around, uh, you know, uh, to to watch the webinar. Uh, standard old question: WordPress versus Drupal versus Joomla. What's your preference? Any anything there? Sure. So my preference is if you've already been working with one and you're very good at it, that's what you should stick with. Shifting back and forth will cause a lot of problems. Uh, beyond that. Um, I'll give a, a quick story. Back in the day, when I used to have a lot more WordPress sites, we'd get hacked too much mm -hmm. because I'm in an industry where hacking happens. So we took the core functionality of WordPress, we created our own internal CMS, so that we had less of a footprint. That said, when I'm approaching stuff from scratch now, I do recommend WordPress. I recommend uh, Yoast SEO for his plugin to get the to handle. 90% of the, the, the problems that WordPress creates for SEOs. But beyond that, then I like to um, look into Bastian Grimm, G-R-I-M-M. -M. He's fanatical with how you set up things for site speed. If you just did like the Yoast plugin, you look to see what uh, Bastian's saying, um, you can create a pretty good website and a great user experience on WordPress. Very good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, with that, Joe, I really want to thank you for taking the time to attend. Um, Great webinar filled filled with information. Uh, if people want to reach you, and I know, um, you know you, you've been very helpful to investment. That's the reason I wanted, like you know, kind of to, to have you here, so people would know kind of the, the, the quality work that, that you guys uh, you guys do. But if people want to reach you, uh, what's the best way to to do so? And what are some of the top things that you can help them uh, with with two different agencies, two different? Uh... Sure. So I mean, I, you can always reach me on LinkedIn. I'm very uh, active there. My name is Joe Sinkwitz, S-I-N-K-W-I-T-Z. Um, also, you can hit me up on Twitter. It's Cygnus SEO, C-Y-G-N-U-S SEO. From there, um, I, if I don't have the answer for you or if, if I'm not the right person, I'll try to point you in to who you should be talking to. But I'm able to handle everything from the really dark side of things on online reputation management and audits to the copy press side of you know creating the content you probably need. 
Very good. Again, thank you, Joe, for taking the time to attend. Thank you, our webinar uh, attendees. Um, we, the reason we do these uh, these webinars is because we want to build a community that uh, really uh, wants to learn from from each other. So please, when you get the YouTube uh, YouTube link, go ahead and share it with your colleagues and uh, friends. Um, uh, also, we'll have our next webinar. We are going to be uh, just, uh, covering several case studies from a 17% conversion rate uh, up to, I think, 230% increase in conversion rate. So uh, I had decided to run through, I think, 10 or 15 different case studies in a span of 45 minutes. And uh, you know, she told me just, I, I can handle. So we'll see how she can handle that, running through so many different case studies. Um, but you'll receive an email uh, from us uh, announcing that next webinar. Again, thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm sitting in Istanbul, Turkey, by the way. Joe, where, where are you where are you sitting? I, I'm in Phoenix right now. Uh, Copy Press is based in Tampa, and my agency is based in Phoenix. There you go, from Phoenix uh, and from Istanbul, uh, Turkey. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and we will see you soon. Awesome. Take care.